Hello, everybody. Welcome to, and this is a, this is a special day here for Storytime with Dutch. We have a brand new opening, which you have seen, and uh, I have a guest today, and a guest that I've known for like forever, and his name is my good friend Jocks Rougeau. Is it? You say it with the S, Jock? Yeah, Rougeau. You say Jacques, but we don't say the S, yes, though. It's like okay, Jacques, not, like not, Jacques not Jacques. the Diver. Yeah, like uh, Jacques Cousteau the Diver, Jacques. I, I got it. <laughs> hey, we got, a, we got a lot of things to talk about, and I have a very special subject that I'm sure that's close to your heart. I'm not going to bring it up now. We're okay. going to talk about it just a little bit later. Okay. So uh, for, for the fans that uh, I probably uh, – not followed your career, which they can only be one or two, but you're from Canada. Fill us in on your background. Well, first of all, let me congratulate you on your opening there, Dutch. That was really uh, awesome. It's, great, uh, wasn't it? It was my yeah, idea. Really, I, like my idea. I like the cactus. It's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I come from, uh, actually, our family is uh, four generations of wrestling. Uh, my great uncle, uh, Eddie Oje, and then my uncle, Johnny Rougeau, and Jacques Rougeau, my father. They were brothers, the Rougeau brothers, the original Rougeau brothers. And then came three sons, which was Raymond, myself, and Armand, the three Rougeau brothers. And then my three sons, they wrestled to uh, the three Rougeau brothers in Quebec only. So, 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 um, yeah, we're a family of wrestling, Dutch. Well, you've been in wrestling all your life since you were a little bitty baby. So yes, you grew sir. Up, so actually, you were you're a part of the, uh, I guess. You know, you, you know, you got the McMahon family, you got the Jared family, you got the family, the Rhodes family. So you're part of wrestling royalty, really, especially in Canada. Yeah, like the Hearts. You know, the Hearts were out in the West. The Hart family, uh, Stu Hart's family, and uh, I, just, I, st I started my career actually with uh, with Stu Hart, uh, Bret Hart, uh, Bret the Hitman Hart was driving the bus at the time in <laughs> 77, 1977, and uh, yeah, so 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 we're definitely. Uh, uh, my father and my uncle and great uncle were legends. The Rougeau family is a big, big name in wrestling. Especially in Montreal. No, not only in Montreal, because my dad used All to over. work in, uh, my dad went to Japan for Inoki, you know, and he went in the States, wrestled a lot. Um, not as much as I did with Raymond with the uh, WWF, but uh, yeah, my Uncle Johnny was the same. You know, my Uncle Johnny used to wrestle guys. They used to go to Detroit at the Cobo Hall, wrestle uh, uh, the Sheik, the original Sheik there, and uh, all those guys like uh, Bobo Brazil, and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Gigi the Greek, and all those guys that uh, Gypsy Joe. Remember Gypsy Joe when we were together in Nashville? Oh. Gypsy <laughs> I, I, was getting, I was getting around to that. That's where I, that was where I first met you. I think so. I, I think so. We were going up the road at the time there from, from Nashville working for Nick Goulis. And, uh, and I used to travel with, uh, with uh, 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 Angelo Poffo, uh, Macho Man's father there, Randy Savage. He was Randy Poffo at the time and, uh, and Angelo Poffo. And, uh, and yeah, Gypsy Joe was part of the business. And, uh, and then uh, in, in all those years, that era, uh, I, I went from territory to territory. And I think we also met in Memphis. I think we met we a couple did. of places. You know, <coughs> and, we did. We did. So, but I'll, we'll, we'll go over some of your earlier years, but let's, let's start talking now. You're in Canada. You have a contest or a participation going on in Canada. Can you explain that to us? What, what is it called? It's Wrestling Academy. It's called Wrestling Academy. It's just an amazing concept. Uh, you know, I, I put that together last year with my girlfriend, and uh, we started sending uh, some messages to all the indie wrestlers, uh, indie uh, wrestlers across Canada, to, to send us some videos. And we we made a contest where where uh, where where uh, there was judges by the ring and. Uh, we pay the airfares and, you know, we pay the hotels and they're all coming to Montreal from Vancouver to Nova Scotia and uh, everything was paid for them. And there was a grand prize uh, of the winners after them being eliminated all the way from the quarterfinals to the semifinals to the finals. And uh, there was four winners of $5,000 plus three months and that QT Marshall at the Nightmare Factory in Atlanta mm -hmm. gave them for a gift. 
to spend a, a like an academy there for three months with them. And the, so that was big time because, uh, you know, Dutch, I got to explain something to you. In, in, in the biggest problem for Canadian wrestlers is to go wrestle in the United States because of the papers. They don't have any working papers to go there. And, and that's the biggest problem. So so what I'm doing them is I'm, I'm, I'm opening them doors to go three months to Atlanta to be seen by 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 the amazing people that are at that school teaching at the Nightmare Factory. You know, you're not only talking of AEW, you're talking of WWE also because Cody Rhodes is one of the teachers there. And, and then there's Billy Gunn, you know, who used to be the smoking guns when I used to wrestle him with Raymond and then QT Marshall. The three guys are teaching. They're giving five days of lesson a week and sometimes twice a day. So my four winners last year, they, they, they went to Atlanta, and, and, and what a great, great opportunity. And, and when AEW came to Toronto for the first time this year, my four winners were, were on the show in AEW, like in front of 10,000 people. So all these indie wrestlers, they send in their videos and stuff, and, uh, and we had this contest, and it went so well last year. And, and, and this year, we're repeating it again, but it's going to be even bigger this year because we have three winners of $10,000. That's how much I made at WrestleMania. <laughs> but anyway, it's three winners of $10,000 plus the three months at the Nightmare Factory again with the Cody Rhodes, QT Marshall, and, and Billy Gunn. So, so this contest is awesome. There's judges by the rings, and there's elimination. And then QT Marshall comes on the giant screen direct from Atlanta. He comes at the Club Soda in Montreal, where the event is happening in Montreal. And we have a giant screen, and then here he is, QT, watching the show from Atlanta. And, and then finally, at the end of every match, he says, okay, uh, I like that match. I like you. I like the way you do this. And I like your charisma. I like the way your ability in the ring. But I'm going to choose you. So then one's eliminated and one keeps going to the semifinals <coughs> and then on, on to, the, to the finals. So it's really a reality show. And, and it's so popular now in Canada. Hey, you need to pitch that to network. <laughs> you know what no, network TV, they may pop on it. Really? They like it. Oh, I would, uh, what's the worst thing they can say? But, but, no. No. But, no. But, but, but to be honest with you, we're, we're, it's got so much bigger this year. Like, you know, all the media, the newspapers, and and, the, and a lot of people are helping in the media. And not only that, I, I kind of used Dutch my, my notoriety in, in all those years, 40 years of wrestling, 45 years in the business, that mm -hmm. uh, I made a lot of contacts across the, the world. And, and, and now I'm doing a many, many podcasts uh, in England. I, I did one with James a couple of years ago, and, and the last year, I think. And then I, I'm going to Zashman in Australia and I'm going I'm doing podcasts everywhere so what the good thing about it is now is the world of wrestling everywhere around the world they know wrestling academy Jacques Rougeau's wrestling academy so it's getting bigger and bigger and you know and, and I think with over, maybe like you said in a couple of years from now and a year from now there's going to be a TV station that's going to say hey this is too good we got to put this on the air well they put on have you seen this the <clears throat> Dana White the slap contest <clears throat> Oh yeah, that? yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The guys one in front of the other there that try to knock yeah. themselves out with a slap. Yeah. <clears> how much talent does that take? You know, I didn't like not... that. Uh, I didn't like oh, that. I didn't I like it. You know, and the guy Brother. goes home to his kids after, you know, and not knowing if he's going to remember them. <laughs> you oh, know. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's brutal. I don't even know how it made TV to tell you the truth. But well, you know, but Dutch, you know, who would have thought? Who would have thought when you look back at our years? You know, being workers like we are, you know, and always taking care of each other in the ring and and looking out for your opponent, and then who would have thought that one day there would be a uh, ultimate fighting? I didn't. I didn't either. I, but I'm not a forward thinker anyway. I think in the past. <clears throat> I don't know what I think. Listen, how did you come up with this idea? Well, this, this idea came up, Dutch, with a, uh, you know, there was a tournament and uh, a contest in, in Montreal, in Quebec, actually, the province of Quebec. It was called Star Academy. And, and it, was with, it was made with singers. And, and, and what they do is they, they, they uh, ask a lot of singers to come and audition. And, and, and then they would eliminate singers week after week. And that's been going on for like 10, 15 years. And then and, and the winner of the contest would go and they would sing side by side with Celine Dion at the, uh, at the Bell mm -hmm. Center, at the Mosin Center, at the Forum, you know, where, where it was at the time, the big event there. So what, it's like a Stanley Cup. They're going to sing with Celine Dion. It was a big break. So, so they were eliminated like that. And, and, and during COVID, uh, I, I started uh, a podcast, doing podcasts like like you're doing right now. I started doing that with a lot of uh, 
Canadian and Quebec celebrities, different styles from, from, from the guy who saved the people from a plane crash to the guy who broke internet to the security of the American security defense, to, to, to singers, to, to hockey players. To, I had all kinds of people that were interesting on my podcast. And one of those persons was Marie Hélène Sibay, which was the one, one of the one who won the singing contest. And, and as I, she was on my podcast, explaining all this, how the emotions and it was and the judges and the, the voting and all this. I was saying, I looked at my girlfriend after the podcast and I said, hey, that would be a great idea with wrestling. Wouldn't you think if, if people could call in and vote, not instead of having a boss or a booker saying who's going, doing what, have the people choose, you know, like who keeps going in this competition. And, then, and so that's how we came up with the idea. G great idea. I was watching some of the clips and, and we'll be showing some of those clips you know, when we go to, when we break this down and we put it in individual, like on YouTube, the little whatever we do. Great. We'll, we'll, Great. we'll, sh we'll show some of that. So how, how does somebody enter this contest? So, so, so now, the, the, of course, we're in the right in the midst of starting this second season, which is in two months from now. It's starting on the uh, 7th of May in Montreal, going all the way through the summer. It's, it's mostly in the fall. You need to contact me. You know, you can contact me on my email, uh, which will give all the information at the end there. On my Facebook, it's public, too. Just send me a, some, an interest. Show me an interest. you got to be Canadian because it's Canadian content. What? You, yeah, yeah. It's just that it's for Canada that's here, but hopefully – Dutch, hopefully, in the next few years, maybe next year, I'm going to open it up to North America, like Mexico, oh, okay. United States, and Canada, because it's getting too popular. You know, I got to tell you something that last year when we did it for the first time, uh, we had like uh, 40 inscriptions. And we had 22 from my own province of Quebec, and there's mm -hmm. 10 provinces in Canada. And, 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 there, and there was only 19 inscriptions from nine other provinces. You know, it's like people didn't believe in the project. They didn't believe in the context, in the, con, in the concept. So, so, so this year, when we did the inscription, and, and we had the winners of last year go to the Nightmare Factory, go to AEW Rampage and Dynamite, and, and get the four dolls that they got, figurines, wrestling figurines, everything that were promised, the $5,000 given to them, well, a lot of credibility came into my project. And and, uh, and now this year, when they found out that it was $10,000 for one woman to win and two men, and then the QT Marshall's in there again. And then so I had this year, I had seven, 70 inscriptions instead of 40, but only 10 from Quebec, 10, 11 from Quebec, and, and something like 60 from Canada, because all the good big wrestlers and the best wrestlers of Canada, completely the best, they all passed the word out to say, hey, Jacques Rougeau is really paying now. This is and QT Marshall's and Dust and Cody Rhodes and Billy Gunn are really teaching you for three months. We got to get in this contest because it's an opening a door for us to to get known in the states. And and then so 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 you have to live in Canada this year again. Hopefully it'll change next year. And you got to know how to wrestle. You know, I'm not. I don't have a school. That, that would help. My school. My my school is closed now. It's not a place where you want to become a wrestler. No 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 no. Some wrestlers are new. They only have one or two years experience, but QT Marshall looks at people for different reasons. He looks at them for the potential, not only for how good they are. So you can be mm -hmm. the best wrestler. You can be wrestling <clears throat> for 15 years, being one of the I, best I, workers. I mean, how, would I, how would I do? I think you'd do great as a judge because your oh, experience, okay. yeah. because you, or, or a referee maybe if you can still bend down. But, you know, I, uh, <laughs> but I, uh, that, but I don't know. But I wouldn't consider you as a wrestler, no. Oh, okay, okay. But but all this to say that the, that that, so, that so far it's amazing what I've learned this year because I, this is a learning process for me too. Putting all this thing together, I keep learning and learning. And what I've learned is like last year I chose all the participants, and this year out of the 34, the 24 men and 10 women, QT Marshall last year when I brought him all the crop to to have him for him to choose. After the show was done and we crowned everybody in, in, in August last year, he, he, I called him the next day. I said, QT, how did you like this experience, you know? And he says, hey, listen. He says, next year, he says, I want to choose the participants with you. And he says, next year, he says, I don't only want to go on the finals to choose the final, the final four. I want to be there on the giant screen for the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and the finals. And, and, and not only that, he's going to come and wrestle this year. He wants to give a chance to one of the semifinalists who's going to be eliminated just before the end to wrestle him on the night of the finals in Montreal because he never wrestled in Montreal. So, 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 so this is just about amazing. I have so many things to say about it. I'm, I'm excited like a little kid here. When it starts May 7th, 
and it's not open to Americans, but next year it will be. Next possibly. year probably will be. I, I think so okay. because it's getting big now. It's really getting – all my sponsors that I had last year, they all jumped in again, and I want to thank my sponsors. I don't want to put them down on the screen, but I want to tell them, I, if they're listening now, that you know we have $50,000 of sponsors now that we were given to us, 20000 for the plane tickets and 30000 for the prizes. If we, and I could never have, never have done that without you, my sponsors, and, and I want to thank you so much. Well, good. But I got, I got to ask you something, Jock. You went to WWE when? I went to WWF in, in 86, 1986. With your brother the first time? Or yeah, the Rougeau brothers, yeah. And you became the Mounties. Now that, not now. And I, let me give you a little run, rundown of how it worked. In 1986, we went to the, as the Rougeau brothers. And then and, and, and two years later, in, in 88... Uh, Vince McMahon came up with the idea of making us become the fabulous Rougeau brothers with Jimmy Hart as our manager. And then, so we did another two years so, uh, as of that. So we were four years as the Rougeau brothers and the fabulous Rougeau brothers. And the funniest thing about that Dutch is the first two years we were there. I remember wrestling the Hart foundation that had Jim, Jimmy Hart as their manager because the Hart mm -hmm. foundation were heels and we were baby faces. And then they switched us heels with the little American flags. There were all American boys and then and, and they switched the Hart's baby face, and we wrestled another two years again with them around the world as Jimmy Hart became our manager. So after those four years, I took a year break and then came back as the Mountie. And then I begged Vince McMahon to have Jimmy Hart as my manager again, one of the greatest managers of all yeah, time. He is. He is. And I, you know, if, you, if I can open up a little parenthesis there for a second, I want to say why Jimmy Hart is the best. Because I think it's important that people know that. They understand that. Because a lot of people say, well, of course, Jacques, you're going to say Jimmy Hart is the best manager. He was yours half of the time. Mm -hmm. That's not the reason why I'm saying it. You know, there's all kind of managers that came to the WWF and WWE. And every time in my whole career, even when I was younger in, in the, the business, every time a manager would come on the microphone, he'd say, let me tell you something. I got the brains to put this together. I got the money. I'm the smart one. And Jimmy Hart was the only one who every time he had the microphone in his hand, every time he had the microphone in his hand, he'd always say, let me tell you something about my man. Let me tell you something about my man. He always made his characters the reason why he's succeeding. He's having success. He would never take the blame because he was the man that was managing or brilliant or this or the, you understand what I'm saying, Dutch? Oh yeah. And, oh, yeah. and for a talent, it's so amazing to have a manager that making you always look so smart and so good when he's the brain. And you know, it's so funny because he made our songs. You know, you know, we don't like heavy metal. We don't like rock and roll. All we like to listen to is Barry Manilow. Hey, we're all American. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was fun. That, that was Jimmy Hart. Uh, and then when I became the Mountie, it was, so, I'm the Mountie. I've had some. I'm brave. <laughs> you know, it was all Jimmy Hart. You know, it's, but he was always going on the on on everywhere and saying how my man you, is the reason. You my first man met, is this. You first met Jimmy in Memphis. Yeah, with you. I think you were there. With oh, the time yeah. we, and then he was with Jerry Lawler at the time, and. Uh, and then they'll, and I'm trying to think Lance uh, Lance Russell was Russell. the commentator. You know, it was good times there. You know, really. Um, I enjoyed and, uh, Memphis. I really uh, enjoyed Memphis. I learned a lot. I learned a lot there. You know, and uh, all those little territories. You know that we did at the beginning there. You know, even Kansas City with Bob Bob Geigel and Pat O'Connor and Bob Brown and and all that. And then with the Fullers, you know, in Knoxville, and then going to Pensacola with Joe LaDuke, uh, my my big rivalry. And they were uh, all fun. It was fun. You know, we had even the crazy Dick Slater that was, you know, uh, going up with his Trans Am, throwing M M M80s out the window, trying to blow us up on the highway oh, after yeah. the show. Did you, know, did you work? Did you work the Tampa territory? Yes, I did for the Grahams and the Briscoes. Yes, I did. Oh, that 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 was a great time too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this, and this is a question that I alluded to when we started. When are we going to see the Rougeau brothers in the Hall of Fame? Oh, Dutch! My God, you're touching. So, <laughs> you're, 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 you know, you're killing me, Dutch. Because you know, I, I've been, I've been, I, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and shoot. I'm gonna shoot with you straight. Oh, okay, had, that's, I, that's what we want. Yeah. I had a big falling out with Vince McMahon, and, and not to get into the details. You know, uh, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying he's right. I'm just saying there's a difference between me and him, and there was promises made that weren't kept, and that was. 
And I, 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 and I told everybody in Quebec, and I told the, the, what happened and my side of the story. Because there's always three sides to the story. There's mine, and there's his, and then there's one on the outside too. So you know, you got to take some and leave some of what I'm saying. But my side of the story was like I told everybody, and that made things a lot worse. It's like putting gas on the fire between me and Vince. And you know, and and, and I think that uh, that Vince honestly needs to to calm down. He needs to to remember. The the, the 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 fabulous Rougeau brothers, what we did for them, the four years of my brother Raymond and the Mountie, the jailhouse match on pay per view, drawing more money than any of them at the time, and, and, and with Big Boss Man, me going to spend the night in jail, and and some the match with Rowdy Rowdy Piper, and the four years against the Hart Foundation and the Tito Santana rivalry, the Bulldogs, the everything that we've done, everybody that I wrestled, they're in the you're Hall of Fame. You're <laughs> passionate. <laughs> you're you're really passionate about this. So, yes, because, you know, it's like I always said, you know what, I've I've learned something in the business, Dutch, and you know that, too, as being a great wrestler as you are, as you were, and, and, and the knowledge that you have that you can't, even in the movies, you can't create Batman if you don't have a great Joker, you know, and then so, so all the people that were built, the talent that was created, they need people to build these guys. So, you know, mm -hmm. you need, you need, takes two to dance. How many times we said that expression? It takes two to dance. You can't, one guy can't be good and the other one no good. And the match was great. When you go into the ring, both matches, go, both guys are great. I think yeah. of guys like Steve Lombardi that were jobbers in the WWF, uh, uh, Barry Orwitz, you know, uh, guys that made us look good. But if you would have reversed the roles, if you would have gave them the belts and we would have been the jobbers, you know, or, then they would have been famous and they would have been superstars. So, so, so it takes two to tangle. And, and also Vince McMahon, my message is clear. And I'm saying it around the world on every podcast, you know, that people bring it up to me is you should at least put the Rougeau name in the Hall of Fame. If you really have a grudge against me that bad, then put my brother Raymond in it, or my dad or my uncle or my great uncle. But we're four generations of wrestlers. And Brett the Hitman you Hart's been in the Hall of Fame twice. Yeah, you would be, <laughs> you would be a hell of a Hall of Fame inductee. Really? I would like to. I would like to hear your speech. It would oh, start at nine. It would start at nine o'clock. You'd finish at eleven thirty. <laughs> and he said, "But wait a minute, one more thing I got to say." And people go, "Oh, please, please, please!" No. Do you think you'll what make you it? Think, Dutch, what, what, what do you think, Dutch? Am I just a no. dreamer here, or I'm just, or should 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 the Rougeau name be in the Hall of Fame? What do you think? I, I think so. And do I you think we should. Are you just because I'm on your podcast now, or, or do you really feel oh. like? The three, yeah, I know. The three characters. Wait a minute. Yeah. Hey, the Quebecers, I was three times tag team champion too, you know, with Carl Willett there, Pierre Carl PCO. So, 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 I, so I had 10 years in the WWF, three major characters that, that not only draw money, but perform. And you know how hard it was sometimes to go when we first came in as the Rougeau brothers in 86 when we were good guys? And the Americans, you know how patriotic they are. It's like, you know, two Quebecers here trying to come in. And so we'd come in every match against the Hart Foundation, you know, or against the Rockers, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, and all those nice teams that we worked against. And we'd start a match. And we, you know, at the beginning when we first came in in 86, we'd come in the ring and they'd say, and, 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 and what's a Gene? What's his name? I mean, Gene, not mean Gene, but Howard Finkel. Howard Finkel yep. would be down in the ring and he'd say, you know, Coming from Montreal, and as soon as you say that, people go like "boo," you know. And uh, but 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 we'd get in the ring, me and Raymond, and we'd work a 20, 25 minute match. And at the end of our match, every match around the world, people were on their feet cheering because we got our ass whipped, you know, or or or, or, or something like that. Or we'd win them over. So we worked so so hard. Uh, to, 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 and then when we became the fabulous Rougeau brothers with the little flags, like, you know, wishing everybody happy Memorial Day when it was Thanksgiving, you know, and, and, and mixing up all the holidays. You know, it, oh, was like, it, it was that's like good. people really hated our guts. Like, you know, the people I see people, you know, I do Comic-Con still today. I'm going in a Comic-Con in Philadelphia next uh, in a couple of weeks. I was in Los Angeles. I was in England not long ago. And everywhere I go. There's a line in front of me for like three hours. People come up to me, and, and and a lot of people say that I'm the greatest intercontinental champion that ever existed. And they all bring dolls when they have the belts, you know, the figurines and all that mm. stuff. We got the intercontinental belt. And the joke is, is I only held it for two days. I'm the shortest ever lived intercontinental champion that ever walked WWF. So, but, so, but you held it. But well, you had you know, it for two days. 
Which I is bought what, two it. days. I which is two days more than it. me. Hey, I bought it, Dutch. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I really did. That's I, even better. <laughs> and that's another thing that's not going to help me get in the Hall of Fame there. I think, Vince, you're so cheap. You know, everybody that won a belt in your business, you should at least present them a, a, a title to bring home. Me, I was lucky. It was my students at my wrestling school that bought you, it for me. You, but have you, know made, you, you have made a tremendous push and a tremendous argument why you should be in the Hall of Fame. So I urge everybody – that's watching this today to write WWE and say that you, you want Jacques uh, Rougeau and his brother Raymond in, in the hall of fame. They read Thank those. You, Thank you, I would send a letter and an email. That's Thank, you so much. Thank you I'm so gonna do much. It, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to start pushing for you guys to get in the hall of fame. Really? I, 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 I really am. Really, you're great. You're great, Dutch. You're a great man. I've always, and, you know, me and you, we've always got along good. I've always liked, even though you teased me the whole time, you know, in my younger career. You're a funny guy, Dutch. People don't know you there. I got to tell you, you're a funny guy. You know, people, you, 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 <laughs> yeah, you're a funny you, guy. You're a funny guy. Yeah, you, you pick on people a lot, and people think you don't like them, but you really like them. It's just that you like to pick on them, you know. Yeah, we made we made a lot of miles together. Uh, <laughs> but the Mounties, this, uh, I read this. The Mounties, the the government of Canada didn't like the Mounties. No, they didn't, Dutch. They, they, that, that's a good, you're bringing up a big point. You know, that's how good the Mountie was, you know, especially the, the jailhouse match. And, well, you know, when, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, when I first started as the Mountie, I, I did a promo. There was like vignettes that they were showing around the world, vignettes for like six weeks before your character became live in the live events and everywhere in the territory, they'd show vignettes of you. And, and the vignette that I had made as the Mountie was absolutely a classic. It was like I'm in a park in, in Quebec. And I'm on my horse and I'm all dressed up as the Mountie and I'm introducing myself as the character as the Mountie and I'm sitting on my horse and here comes this car <laughs> beside me. Here comes this car beside me and there's an American with his girlfriend that he's lost. He's trying to get back to the United States, but he's in Canada now. So he comes up yeah. beside me. He comes up beside me and then he says, uh, he puts his window down. He stops beside me and he says, excuse me, officer, excuse me, officer. And I look down to him and I go like, I'm not an officer. I'm the Mountie. So the guy looks, holy shit. He looks at his girlfriend and he says, oh, I got a wacko here, boy. And then, so he turns back to me up and he looks out the car and says, excuse me, Mr. Mountie. Can you tell me how to get back to the U.S.? He says, I'm lost. Can you tell me how to get back to the U.S.? I'm lost. And then I said, uh, so then I go like this. And I, 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 I get off my horse real slow. I bend over my horse. I put my leg on top and I go down to the floor. And then when I get to the floor, I say, uh, Come here. So the guy's sitting in his car and he's like looking at his girlfriend. Should I get out? This guy's a wacko, you know? So he looks back at me and I said, and then his girlfriend says to the guy, says, get out, chicken, go ahead. So he gets out of the car and I says, follow me. So I bring him in front of my horse. And then I take the face of my horse like this, the head up like this. And, and the camera's right in the face. And I say, you see that part of my horse? It always points to Canada. Come here. <laughs> and then I bring him in the back of my horse. And then I lift the tail of my horse. Oh, God. And the camera's right there in the in the donut. And, you know, and then I say, <laughs> and then I say, you see that part of my horse? It always points to the USA. You know, and so, so the guy, like, he looks at me like, and then he starts running. He jumps in his car and he spins his wheels and he gets out of there, you know. So they showed that vignette for six weeks before I ever came to the territory as the Mountie. I mean, I got to tell you something. The, the Americans don't have a good sense of humor. Because when I came, when I got into the buildings, people were throwing stuff at me like rocks and stuff, and it's like I'm saying, "Hey, hey, guys, this is just a character, like you know." So, <laughs> so who, who came? Who came up with that interview? You did it. So, so, so no, they did. So Vince did. Okay. That was Vince. So here's the deal. The, the, always the, take, so always much, take, always take credit for that. There was, there was no, yeah, no hey, you did. Vince, I got to give Vince what uh, I got to give him what's due. And then, and, and so I, I, I was the one who brought the electric shock stick. That was my idea. But okay. all this to say, but all this to say that uh, one day Vince calls me up for a meeting and he says to me, he says, Jacques says, we got a problem. He says, uh, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they took an injunction against uh, against us. And, and he says, you can't wrestle on TV in Canada anymore. <laughs> and that was good. That was bad. That was good and bad because that was good because I was doing my job right. But that yeah. was bad because all the TV tapings that they're doing, 
the two day of tapings that we're doing for around the world, I, I couldn't be on them anymore. So I wasn't getting any more exposure. And that's when uh, they had to kind of fade me out there as a Mountie. But the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, I always said to myself, I said, hey, guys, you should get off your high horse there. You know, <laughs> let me let me ask you, you when you work when you worked in Memphis, you met Jerry Jarrett, right? Yeah. Really? Oh, my condolences. Yeah. My condolences. He just, he just he just passed away. He had his. I know, uh, I know. I called, I called Double life. J up. I called Double J up. And, 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 Did you talk to him? Away. No, I he didn't answer, but I gave. But he answered me back by text, though. You know, and yeah. and he said thank you so much for giving me the message. I left him a message because you know that was with the good days. You know, and he was he was a good man. He was a funny man, uh, uh, Mr. Jarrett. You know, he always, and, I liked him. And, yeah, if you paid attention to what he was doing, he taught you the right way. Yeah, but you would learn on your own. He taught me more about booking and more about getting a, a character over. And he oh, said yeah. it with, with not a lot of words. He would do this and this and this. And I used to ride with him a lot. He had a golden tooth, eh? I think, or did yeah, he, he did. I think he, he did. He was a smart man. He was so he yeah, and he was so calm when you talk to him. Like he was a man that would never. I, I don't remember seeing him all like crazy and wild. I remember him just no. being like a, he talks sense when he talked to you. Very, very smart man. So when you, where else did you work in the United States? You work Atlanta, the territory of Atlanta. Oh no? my God. Yes. I worked Atlanta. <laughs> that was, what a great, no, but what a great time for me, Dutch. I got to tell you why. How old were you? I was uh, 18 years old, 19 years old. I was 19 years old. I was in 79. And or 80, 79 or 80, those that, that era, and, yeah. and but it was good, but yeah, D uh, Dusty was the booker and Ole Anderson and those days, Tommy Rich was there and all those times, it, it was that time. But I'll tell you, Ronnie West, the referee, was a great man for me. Ronnie West was such a guy, I used to go up the roads with him and, and down up the roads, and uh, and he'd helped me a lot, Ronnie West. But what was good about Atlanta, I gotta tell you this. So many good things came out of this. Dutch, can you put that face of yours again there on, on half a screen? Yeah, I like to see you when I'm talking to you. Because oh, okay. this is, I want to talk to you. This is an important one I'm going to share with you. I want to see your expressions. It's amazing. When I went to Atlanta, I was very young in my career, and I was uh, I was what you call a jobber. You know, everybody would beat me. <laughs> you know, I was, I was getting beat. I, but I was on, on TBS, you know, like Saturday mornings, Saturday nights, Sunday afternoons. And that was the only territory at the time, contrary to all the other territories I've yes. been to, that, that you were seen from, from Boston to Los Angeles. You mm -hmm. know, you were seen coast to coast. What great exposures for all the other territories. And, and, and Ole Anderson, he really liked me. And Dusty Rhodes, they really liked me. So, 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 so I was doing a lot of jobs. I remember one time going into it. And I changed my name, actually. So a lot of people who go down in the, in the sheets say you'll find Jerry Roberts. You know, and even it was, but, but I stayed a year and a half. And that Jerry, was you, Jerry Roberts. That was I've me. seen that name. I said, "Who in the hell was that?" Yeah, yeah, that was me. And because I didn't want the Rougeau name to look so bad, you know, on the statistics, you know, I was getting beat. <laughs> I was getting beat every time, you know, like, doing jobs. And 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 one time I was in, I, I got into the TV station in Atlanta TBS, and we're we're taping for the Omni Show at night. And and Ric Flair, which is a great man, I love Ric Flair. For me and him, me, Ric Flair is going to be a god for me in wrestling. No matter mm -hmm. what his outside things are, me in wrestling, he's a god. Because when I went to Atlanta, I got in the booking sheets in the morning, and I got to the TV station, and then I saw Ric Flair against Jerry Roberts, and I went like, oh, holy shit, holy shit! I was like, oh, 19 years old, and he's the world champion, you know. And I see six minutes on the sheet. I got to go six minutes with him. So I'm going like, oh, my God. You know, he, so so anyway, so when he, I was waiting for him, every time someone come in the dressing room, you know, I'd waiting to see him come in. So I could, so when I finally came in, I said, how you doing, Mr. Flair? I said, uh, my name is Jerry Roberts. You know, he says, oh, he says, I know you, Jerry. And I says, oh, I says he says, we're working together today. And I said, yes, sir, we are. He says, uh, I said, well, what do you want? Oh, I said, don't worry. I'll call it out there. You know, mm -hmm. and that's all he said. Don't worry. Yep. I'll call it out there. So I was, so listen to this, Dutch. We get in the ring. The match was like six minutes long. And for five minutes, he's got me grabbing the headlock, doing leapfrogs, sunset flips, cross body blocks, drop kicks. Because I, I had an amazing drop kick when I was young at the time. And he kept making me shine and making me look good. And at the end, at the very, very end, I did a big cross body block at the top. He ducked. I hit the floor. He put the figure four on me and he beat me. Mm -hmm. And I got back to the dressing room. And, and I was flabbergasted. I couldn't believe how, and I was seen coast to coast. You know, he just made me coast to coast on TV. And I went to see him and I, and I said, Mr. Flair, I said, 
why'd you do that? I said, I said, you're the main event tonight in the Omni. And he looked at me and he said, this may be this, may this be a great lesson for every wrestler upcoming that's coming. He came up to me and he said, you know what, kid? He says, if I would have went in the ring and I would have swept the ring with you and I would have beat you the whole time, he says, who would I would have beaten? I would have beat a nobody. Yes. Now you came in. He's now you came in, a young Frenchman, a good-looking kid, and he says, "You got my butt rocking all over the place," and I beat somebody. Yes, and, and used and, to be and, the, I used to be the philosophy, and I used uh, and Ric Flair for me from that day on will be a god for the rest because he helped me so much in my career. And from then on, I remember a time I got to tell you something really wild that come, just to, to finish the story up that that I really learned. One day I'm sitting in the dressing room and it's Macho Man sitting in front of Hulkster. They're going up one against each other, mm -hmm. and I and, and I'm just seeing them like uh, I'm just seeing them face to face trying to figure this match out. You know how it's going to be like the two egos. You know, two great people but two egos, and it's like and 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 so so Hulk is sitting in front and I'm just seeing Hulk saying like. Uh, well, you know, I'm 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 gonna come in. I'm gonna do that leg drop at the end there. You know, boom. So 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 much. Of him, <laughs> so much. So much. And I was like, mm. so you're eavesdropping on this. So, so listen, yes, I am. So much. Yeah. of going like, hmm. So then much. Of says, well, you know, uh, I'd like to go up the top. He says, I'd like to go up the top rope there and uh, do that big elbow there. And uh, Hulk's going like, uh, okay, okay. So then Hulk says, uh, you know, I'm gonna go ahead when I come in, hit the ring there. I'm gonna do this. I say, I want you to leave the ring, like to get out of the ring there, you know. So so much of us, ooh, okay. So he got he's gonna get out too. So so I seen these two guys calling what they want to do. And one day I'm in England and I got the main event, the Mountie against the Macho Man with Miss Elizabeth in the corner. So I'm coming in. The Mountie was very popular in Europe because of the costumes, you know, they have yeah. costumes like yeah. uh, so I would my, my character was really over in Europe. So I was working against for the title, the world title against Macho Man. So I get in the dressing room and I sit in front of Macho Man and and, and, and Randy sits in front of me and he goes like this as because you know I knew him from, from Nashville working with Nick Goulas, you know, I yeah. him for a long time. So so he comes and he sits in front of me and he goes like this and he says, uh he says uh, so I says, listen, I said, uh, he says, no, no, no. He says, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and tell you. He <laughs> says, uh, he says, I'm going to go up at the end. And he says, I'm going to come off with the big elbow there. And he says, I'm going to, is that okay with you? I'm going to finish you right there in the middle. I said, oh. So I looked at him and I says, oh, I was hoping you say that, Randy. And I said, you know what, Randy? I said, you know that part when you grab the guy by the hair and you start running and you jump over the top and you give him a clothesline on top of the rope? I said, I want you to do that to me. And I said, you know that? And I start saying all the moves, every freaking move that he likes to do. I start saying, hey, I want you to do that to me. I want you to do that to me. And about two minutes later, he looked at me and he says, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I said, and I, said I, says, I know. He says, well, you give a good drop kick. He says, why don't we put that in there? And he started giving me shit. Yeah. So it's like I, I used to reverse psychology. Like, you know, like, like give everything, give everything, and it's going to come back to you. Like you know, people are gonna come back to you, and that's how good, I, I. That's how I brought thinking. up my. That's how I brought up my students in my wrestling school, and and and, and so so I'm one of the lucky ones because I I have all this knowledge of of, of of older wrestlers like yourself, Dutch. You helped me a lot too. I remember you helping me too. A lot of guys helped me in the business, and uh, and and I was I may have looked stupid at the time, but I was listening. <laughs> and, you know, so 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 I used a lot of that. In, in, my, in my wrestling school for 20 years and in my profession. And that's what I think got me so far in the business because, you know, I, I, all you guys have helped me out. Okay. You're from Montreal. Sammy Zane is from Montreal. Correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Now, Montreal's in Quebec. Or no? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. And uh, Kevin Owens is from Montreal. Kevin Owens is there. And there's one more from there. I, I don't know. Really? Anyway, I, I didn't even know Sami Zayn before last uh, last week, uh, before he got such an ovation when he came to work. Uh, because, you know, I, 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 I got to put in context there that when I had my falling out with Vince 30 years ago, I just yeah. turned my TV off. <laughs> you know, I just, I never, never watched one show. Not one, Dutch. Not one. Not 10 minutes of a so show. So you haven't watched the Sami Zayn and the no. Roman Reigns no. arc? No, no, I haven't watched nothing of that. And I, the only thing, the only reason why I know Kevin Owens is because Kevin Owens, Kevin Steen, when he came to mm. my school, he was 14 years old. <clears throat> and, I, and his daddy had to sign for so him. So you, you train Kevin Owens? 
from 14 years old to 18 years old for four years i showed him how to walk to crawl and how to dance and how really? to talk yeah for four years he never did anything else but work in uh, exclusively with me for four years from 14 to 18 years old he was my student well and i then, didn't know that yeah and then I, we had a, then we had a falling out because in my company at the time because i was away from vince and i was in fighting with vince and i wanted to be completely different than vince my guys that worked with me had to work with me only and, and and it was exclusive but the thing was good about that it was like all my shows in quebec for the last 20 years before covid they were all sold out 3000 4000 5000 people and i would go sell the tickets in every company myself knock on doors fill out the arenas and i didn't want the guys a lot of guys, I had a lot of heat with a lot of Indies in Montreal, a lot, because they were saying, well, if I work with you, I can't work with the other. I said, no, and I'll explain to you why. Because if you on a Friday night go work in front of 50 people in the basement of a church and you break your neck or you break your arm or you twist your ankle, and I went to promote your my family show, because it was a family show I had, a really orientated for kids and older, and if I go promote to a company that buys 40 tickets and 20 tickets, promise them that the Spider-Man is going to wrestle the mummy, and you know, mm -hmm. and if the mummy got in front of 10 people the night before, he couldn't make the show because of an injury, then I look like a liar. So my show was hurt. And, and, and the, the thing was different with my company, too, there, Dutch. It was really uh, different. It was like before we got into the show, for like two months, we'd practice three times a week in my wrestling school the match. We'd, mm -hmm. I'd set up the matches. I'd work up the matches. So when we got into the live events, they were awesome matches. <laughs> you know, they were awesome. So, so I couldn't afford to build these, these matches. And end up being at my show then in front of 5,000 people and saying, oh, I'm sorry, Spider-Man's not going to be here tonight because last night he twisted his ankle in front of 10 people in the basement of the so-and-so. <laughs> you know, so, so that was the reason. But Kevin Owens, he was such a great wrestler, a great student. He learned so fast. He was always ahead of everybody. Like, you know, every time I teach lessons, he was always running ahead of me. I'd say, Kevin, slow down. I said, you know, the others got to follow too. The others got to follow too. And then at a, there came a point after four years of working with me, he just gave me his notice. He says, no, nope, I want to go wrestle somewhere else. I said, okay, good luck. And that was the last time I talked to him. I never talked to him since. I never had a word with him, hello or nothing. I only Very, heard him bad-mouthing my school and, and stuff like that. But I, I, never, I never had a bad word with the kid. I was, the kid was such a lovable kid. You know, the kid, mm -hmm. when he came to see me at 14 years old, he would be like, a, how can you say that, a, and get close to the the boss there and be nice and always be nice. He was that kind of guy for 14, 10 years. His dad was so nice. His mom was so nice. You know, so so he was like, and then at 18 years old when he, he left, he just he, he just changed completely his opinion on me. So he must have been holding it in for four years. <laughs> but, so so what, what, he doesn't like you now? No, he doesn't like me. He really wow. bad. He, well, I don't know. He, I, and I don't know, to be honest with you, because I never talked bad about him. I just, mm -hmm. you know, and, it's like, and, and he just didn't like, I, I think there's this thing in, in, in our business, this jealousy. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, and I'm sure it was like that in small territories and, and in Quebec, it's the same way. There's a lot of jealousy sometimes between mm -hmm. federations and there shouldn't be. No, there shouldn't not really. Be. And I was doing my business like the way it was. And if you didn't like my business, you leave, you go somewhere else. I'm not holding you. I'm not handcuffing you. I'm just saying that in my company, it works like that. And he should have respected that, and he should respect that because he learned how to crawl with me, and he learned how to walk with mm -hmm. me, and he learned how to dance and run with you me. You changed his diapers. I did, for sure. And I told him how to do a microphone <laughs> and do an interview on the mic. I yeah. showed him all that stuff. He should only have recognition for me today, Kevin Owens. And that's he not should, what I'm he should Really, he should acknowledge you. And then that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing all kinds of bad stuff that he's saying. You know, he even degraded my school. Like, you know, how can you stay? He laughed at my school that we had because it wasn't a flea market. You know, but but what you got to understand is that, uh, that my school had in a flea market, it was free rent. You know, so, mm -hmm. so and I wasn't making a lot of money at the time. Then when I had my school, I quit the WWF. So, and the people were very nice to have us there. But he went on an interview live around the world saying that it was just a flea market and this and that. I said, no, no, Kevin, don't. Don't don't say that. Don't don't say that because you learn there. <laughs> you know that's where you learn. Uh, we're yeah. gonna leave Kevin Owens alone right now. Let me let me ask you this. You got any Ole Anderson stories? Ole Anderson, just that he was. You know, I heard that he was the. I guess, excuse my language. I heard he was one of the greatest assholes of all times. So a lot of people say that, and for me, he was a god. I love him. Because yeah. for me, he took me in. He took me in. He took care of me. He liked me. He, he gave me an opportunity. So, you know, for me, he was always, you know, he always had that arrogant. Uh, 
that's that's only that's only he always had that arrogant talk you know look or or, or uh, conceited uh, you know like he was but he was he was nice to me you know he was he gave me great opportunity he he made my career he helped me make my career so so i love ole anderson you know i uh, it's all one, like i i got to tell you the story one day he come up to me and i'm down there and he says <clears throat> and he just kept looking at me i says what what he says you know mm. something i can't fire staying i can't fire him I said, okay. But he said, if I can fire you. I said, all right. He says, Lex Luger. I said, yeah. I can, I can't fire him. Okay. But I can fire you. And he kept on why he can fire me and kept on. And he worked it into this monologue. Jesus. Finally, it took him like two or three minutes to get through it. And I'm just looking at him. And he says, and don't forget that. I can fire you. And I never have forgot it to the day he, he could fire me. So I, I always, I always loved Oli. Oli and Gene, when I first saw them, I was a kid <clears> in, the, <throat> in the Carolinas, and they were a hot team. Yeah, I, a, I never had, met Gene that much. Oh, I met Gene a little bit, but not at the end of Gene, me it they was were hot. Bit. They were hot because of Oli. Oli really? would cut that promo, and Gene really? didn't oh, yeah, stay he was down good down. on the mic. Yeah, he was good. So one time he came back for the ring after they worked was two hot baby faces in, in Greenville, South Carolina. And a guy who was like 76 years old or something, he came every week and he had a hawk bill knife and he cut only from here. I down. saw that scar. I Damn. saw that scar. He, it was like a hundred stitches to stitch him up. I saw it. Of course, I didn't they, know that uh, happened. they arrested the guy. Holy man. Took him to court. But he was 76 years old, and you know what they gave him? They didn't give him any prison time. He's so old. Mm -hmm. They gave him some probation or suspension for a year or whatever. But the thing that hurt him the most was they banned him from going to wrestling, to wrestling. on Monday nights. Wow. And he was 77 when they sentenced wow. him. I'm not sure. Well, it's a and good he, thing they did. And, and he and he died. He died about a year later. It's a good thing they did because, you know, a guy who brings a knife, I wouldn't want to, for me to be cut like that, you know. <laughs> Jesus. But, that's, but what killed him was not the probation yeah. and all that. It was not yeah. being able to go to wrestling. Dutch, I, know, I, I know this is your podcast, but I, I, I got to ask you a question if you don't mind. If I say the name Jim Cornette, what does oh that my say? God. What does that say to you? Well, Jim Cornette makes an impression on everybody. And according to the mood he's in, one of the greatest, I think the greatest talker in professional wrestling was Cornette. And he's he's great talking, just listening to him. <clears throat> I made a few trips with him and I was around him in Smoky Mountain, and he would all of a sudden he would just break out in this impromptu like promo, but he was actually talking about somebody and he would cut it. He would whittle them down, whittle them down, whittle them down. And they felt like zero when he was done with them. But the guy, he, he's a wrestling historian. Uh, we don't agree on politics, but other than that, I love Jimmy. He was my, uh, who did he manage first? Do you know that? No, I, I want you to ask me the same question. I ask you, what do you think of Jim Cornette? Okay, I'm gonna tell you what I think of Jim Cornette. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what I think of Jim Cornette. I think he was a great manager, and every time, you know, I, I, I every time I crossed him in WWF or even in the smaller territories when we we were together, he was always coming up to me and he'd say, "Hey Jacques, how you doing, Jacques? Mm -hmm. How you doing, Jacques?" And then WWF, "Hey Jacques, hey Jacques, always nice to me, always kind to me." Yeah. And then when I left the WWF, I started hearing podcasts and somebody sent me some messages that he was sending. Like he was sending out like, oh, Jacques Rougeau is an asshole. He's this and he's that. And he cut me down. He cut me down. And it was like on a personal stand. And I, and I was, you know what, Dutch? If ever I heard you cut me down. Oh, let me finish. If ever I heard you cut me down, I would be hurt because I've always loved you. I've always liked you. <laughs> and 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 then when then when he cut me down like that, and people were making me listen because I was saying nice things about him. People were saying, "Well, he's not saying the same thing about you." And then and, and and I've never crossed path with him yet. 
But I, I can't wait for that day to just be very humble and polite to him and come up to him and say, Jimmy, you fooled me. You, mm -hmm. you fooled me because you always were nice to me when you when you when you met me, when you crossed path with me and when we crossed the, in, the, in the dressing rooms. And and that's not what you thought of me. I said, what you, do you, you think? Ha what do you think happened? I think he never liked me, I guess. He was just acting, or I don't know, or he, but he was always so nice to me. <laughs> but it's, it's hard for me to, to, to comprehend. You know, it would, be, it would be the exact same thing, Dutch, as like I said, if someone would come up to you and say, hey, I heard Jacques Rougeau do a podcast and talk about you like you were a double cross or you were a two-faced or you were this, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sure you'd be hurt because, because, you know, I always told you that I loved you. And I always no, told I would you. Actually, what I'd do, I'd get on a plane – and I would fly one way to Montreal, and I would track you down. And I that's, would, how I, that's how I feel, but I don't think I would gain anything by going to No, me. you would But I don't, I don't know what happened. But, see, I've always loved Jimmy, always. And if, if I heard that he would call me a no good SOB, or, that would hurt me too. So I hope just one day, Dutch, if ever you cross path with him again, that you explain I'll, that to him. That you, that, you, that you tell him that he, he's, I don't know if it was free, was free talking or free just being free, like, you know, uh, uh, entertaining some people that don't like me and just joining in the club or whatever. And uh, uh -huh. because I'm not, I'm not liked by everybody. I got to admit there. I'm, uh, you know, I got there's something I'd explain to you, Dutch. And then when, and if I'm, I, if I'm honest and I've always been honest, you know, uh, <laughs> you have, you have, you have normal uh -huh. people, you have normal people that are here. And then yeah. you have, uh, you have uh, autistic people that are here, and I could be somewhere around <laughs> yeah, here. In the middle. In the middle. Yes. So I have a little bit of both. So, you know, I, I, I had a lot of heat sometimes. But you know why I had a lot of heat too sometimes? I got to tell you this. I, I, just so, so people want to know sometimes, how come Jacques, you seem like such a nice guy, and, you know, and some other times people hate you so much? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's because sometimes it's like oh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up something. Like one time I'm in the dressing room in the WWF, but just to give you one of the many examples. And I have Pat Patterson who comes up to me and he and, and he says to me, says uh, to me and Raymond, he says, "Hey guys, says, <clears throat> you mind speaking English? Because we're speaking French, it's my native language. You know, we speak yeah. better French than English. So we're in the dressing room, so we're speaking. So so I so I asked Pat. I said, what what do you mean? He says, well, he says Brutus, you know, he doesn't like, you know, he th he's bitching because he thinks that a lot of guys think you're talking against him. And I said, what? I says, so I said, why don't you go tell uh, Tiro Santana to stop sp uh, speaking Spanish to, to Pedro Morales? Or, 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 you know, I said, what's this? Mm -hmm. so, so then I told, uh, so I, I said, I, I, I said my way to Brutus. You know, I said what I thought about that, you know, and then, but I understand a lot of the guys were prejudiced against Montreal and, and the French Canadians and, and the Canadians because many reasons. One of the reasons were every time they got their booking sheets and they had to come to Wrestling Canada, it was like, Oh shit! I'm gonna lose forty percent of my paycheck because the money's not the same. Uh -huh. You know, they lose forty percent, and then they couldn't bring their drugs in. You know, if they want to come get customs. You know, so so when they had Canadian bookings and stuff like that, they would go like, oh shit, you know, and and then. But but me, if I had boys in the dressing rooms talking bad about that situation, not personally Quebecers or Canadians personally, but just a situation, yeah. I would have problems understanding that because if a guy would say oh that goddamn canada or something you know i'd say like hey well that goddamn united states too you know like uh, <laughs> and, and, and then, so 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 understand what i'm saying where i was there in the middle there sometimes i i i, I wish i could go back in time because i never was mean to anybody in the business i never hurt anybody in the business i never meant any harm to anybody but sometimes my mouth got me in trouble sometimes because i was proud and I was uh, prone. How do you say prone in English? It's a, uh, uh, you know, you act, you react fast, you yeah. know, before thinking. You know, you, you, you uh, how do, what's that word in English when you, you, you act yeah, before thinking? Prone is the word. You're prone to do this. Really? Prone, you, yeah, yes. That's, okay. a, that's, a, that's so, actually so, a good word. So I was like that. So, so, uh, but, uh, but I never I, had any malice. And uh, one day, I'm, I'm going to tell you this now. One day we got in the car. And this is what I tell people on this podcast. This is like two guys getting in a car, mm. making a trip. This is the same way we would talk on the trip, just back and forth. It's just me and you. You got in the car with me one day. What did I said, do? <laughs> no, you just got in the car and you said, you didn't say nothing. And, and 
you looked like you were worried about something or bothered about something. I says, you okay? You Yeah. I said, no, some, you may not remember this, but you said, I hope I heard a knock at my door today. And I opened the door and it was Terry Taylor. Oh yeah. I remember that story. <laughs> and he punched me right in my mouth. I said, <laughs> what? Yeah. What? and then he turned and walked off. Yeah. What was that about? You no, told me that I forgot. I'm gonna tell you just to make it all juicy. You know, I, I you know, I, <laughs> I didn't always made great moves. You know, Terry Taylor up to this day, you know, I love him so much, and you know, I think he has the greatest respect for me, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But at the time, he had this good-looking girl that was working at a mall, not too far. But Terry Taylor had a good-looking girl in every town. You know, he was a handsome man. He was like every all the girls were after him. And, and this girl, you know, she she really caught my attention. Like, you know, she she was right next to where I was staying. So I was going to shop every day. And finally, I went up to her. <laughs> I went up to her, and, and, uh, and my and my 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 uh, my hormones took over. And I yeah. uh, I told her that she'd be a lot better off with me than she'd be with Terry Taylor because you know because because Terry Taylor is not someone who wants to get attached to anybody you know but for me you're like the girl of my dream and so so she went to repeat that to him and so when he knocked on my door and opened the door he kind of jumped on me and punched me and then and I remember when him grabbing I grabbed him too and I said I'm not gonna fight you Terry I'm not gonna fight you and he was on top of me he just he wanted to and then he just got back up and he left and 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 then. So actually, he just uh, gave me a receipt, which I deserved, because you can't do that. You can't go talk to another girl and talk bad about a guy. I just, it was a mistake I made, but I was like 20 years old, 21 years old. Who doesn't make mistakes? So, so okay. here's the, when he so knocked here, on the door, did you know what he was knocking on the door for? No, I didn't know who it was or nothing. I just opened the door and I got but a when punch. you opened the door and you saw <laughs> his hand, <laughs> and I got a punch, and that was like that. And then, the, and that was it. Then we start scrubbing, and the and that didn't last two seconds. And then, then I said, I'm not going to fight you, Terry. And I said, and, and then he told me why. Then he says, you know, you talked to her. You had no business talking. I said, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. And that was it. And that was the end of the story. And it's so funny because, you know, you live and learn in life, you know, nobody's perfect. And I made a mistake. And I, but that helped me through the rest of my career. So that's a good thing. Now, the other thing that I got to tell you that's really that I, that why I like Terry Taylor so much is after the incident I had with the British Bulldogs, with the, with the bullying they were doing, and finally that I stood up for myself. And I was, uh, was at a time where they were really heavy on, on ribs and, and things. They were, they were doing a lot of damage to a lot of wrestlers, the Bulldogs. And, and, and when I stood up and, and I finally did what I had to do, uh, all the boys were kayfabing me. Nobody was coming to talk to me because they knew the Bulldogs would do a comeback and come and beat me up after or kill me because after I had his four teeth leave his face. And then so, so, so then he uh, – but Terry Taylor – was the first guy that came to see me when I was walking, when nobody was speaking to me for about a week. <laughs> and then, then Terry Taylor came behind me and he slapped me on my butt. And then he told me, he came up to me and he says, you know what, John? He says, you did what a lot of guys wanted to do. And he says, I surely wouldn't have done it, <laughs> you know? And then, and, and, and so he had, I know he has a lot of respect for me. You know, I know I gained his respect back, and that's a good thing because, you know, I had lost it at the time when I was 20 years old, and mm -hmm. I gained it back when I was, you know, whatever, 35 or 40. Have you have you written a book? No. You need to write a book, man. These stories are great. That's what yeah. people want to hear. They want to hear the stories. That's the basis for this podcast is stories. You know, people don't really want to hear, well, I won the title here, and then I went there, and I just – they don't give a shit about that. They want to hear what happened on exit 66 down there in Mississippi somewhere <laughs> when you got in a fight or you got drunk or you got arrested. <laughs> That's what they really want to hear. Okay. How did you get along with Bret Hart? Very, very good. In the ring, outside the ring. He was a great, great, great friend of mine. Uh, the only thing about Bret, he was hard to do business with. You know, he was, uh, Brett was a guy that was, he, uh, he didn't like to do jobs, you know, and for, for one reason or another, we were always taught, like, you know, like, uh, do what the boss wants, you know, and then you'll get yep. somewhere, you know, and then, then he had the philosophy of don't do any jobs and you'll get somewhere, you know, so, so, 
So that was the only conflict that, that, that we had, that we never had a conflict, never had. But uh, even he was on my podcast two years ago. I did my podcast during COVID and stuff, and I meet him. I was with him in England. We laugh, we, we joke, and I start with his dad. I love him to death. Okay. <clears throat> I gotta, I... Let me ask you this. Do you think Bret Hart was the best there is, the best there was, and the best there will ever be? You well, that? I think he was one of them. Mm -hmm. One of them. Not the one of them. I think then again. But he didn't say that. He didn't say. But I, I think I'm know. one of the best there was ever was. Well, you know, Brett's allowed to. He tell believes his, that. Brett's allowed to to tell his story like he wants to. It's his story. Yeah. yeah. You know. So so, so I'm. Uh, you know, I could go ahead and and, and say you know uh, uh, th that I think I'm one of the greatest uh, wrestlers in, in, in Canada. But I but 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 it would be my story. You know, so so I'm allowed to say it, but but I but I I uh, I, I think that Brett is one of the a, a great technician, a great wrestler. I really enjoyed working with him, and that I think we were the same. I think one needed the other. I think, uh, like I said, you know, I I, I did as I just didn't. Uh, he got so many titles, and he did so many good things and right things to get all those pushes. And I think he also had this charisma. You know, he had this. Uh, this this look what the girls really loved and I think he, he, he I think uh, you gotta wait there tell you tell your mistress you gotta call her back there okay and uh, you get that Dutch I said tell your mistress you're gonna call her back okay oh. okay <laughs> that's good it's not her okay. it's my daughter okay okay yeah yeah it's your story see you're allowed to say it like you want to also <laughs> but uh no, I think was Brett, was, I think was Brett, Brett yeah. let me ask was Brett a national hero in Canada. I think Brett's a yeah. I think I think Brett's a world hero. I think uh, wherever we go around the world, Brett is very much more recognized than than, than any of the other Canadians. I okay. do that. I the believe the story that. with him and uh, Michaels, Shawn Michaels. Yeah, you you agree with what he did? <clears throat> no, I don't agree with what he do you did. Believe because Vince, do you believe Vince set that up for him to lose? I know he did. I, I believe that's it. so. I believe he did because I know Brett working with him, and then and then listen, we beat Brett in the in, in Montreal. You know, me and Raymond become the world tag team champions in the WWF, and uh, and 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 the only reason why that happened was like uh, when they got on TV the next Saturday is like they never acknowledged we were champions. It's like in the newspaper during the week they said there was a the wrong guy in the ring, so they gave us a false pop in Montreal to all the fans. You mm -hmm. know, and they did. I heard that they did that with the Rockers and that. I think Brett managed himself to be put in a position where he became that superstar. I think he did it the right way. I think that me and Raymond and me and in many cases did it the wrong way because we were always a yes man, yes man, yes man, yes man. And when that didn't pay off at the end with Vince, my relationship with him, because mm -hmm. I was so easy going that I said, yes, yes, yes. And finally he didn't give me what he promised. So, so I just turned the page on him and that was it. So, so I think that Brett did the right move, and I, because Brett did all those moves, I will that I would call selfish moves because we all worked together. We all wanted to have our chance, but I think Brett was very smart. He in business, he was very selfish, and that paid off for it. Hmm. And in Montreal with Shawn Michaels, in Montreal, what happened is Shawn Bret Hart was leaving to go to WCW. He was yes. leaving the WWF, and he didn't want to give the titles to Shawn Michaels before he left. You know, and that made no sense. It's like you're working for Coca-Cola and you're going to go work yeah. for Pepsi and you're not going to give the truck of Coca-Cola before you go work for Pepsi. You're just going to keep the truck and you're going to change the writings on the truck. You know, you can't, but, you, can't, but you, you know, can't things do. like that, when they happen, actually Vince took that and made it work for him. Then he become the boss that everybody hated. He took a surreal life situation, which is real, and turned it and made a mint out of it. He was... He, when Vince was a heel, he, they were printing money. Yeah. Abdullah the Butcher, where is he from? Abdullah is from Ontario, right next to Montreal. He was uh, my uncle Johnny and my father. They were promoting in Montreal in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And uh, they, they, they took in Abdullah. And, uh, and I can't remember. Larry, Larry, Larry Shrimes was his name. And they they put a sheet on Larry, Larry Shreve. Shreve, Larry Shreve, yeah. And they put a they put a sheet on his head, and they called him Abdullah. They said he was from Sudan, and they created that. Like Ivan Koloff, same thing. Ivan Koloff, my uncle Johnny, created that character. Yeah. And I, says, I, I tell this story. I was so stupid 
when I first started, I was working in Atlanta and Abdullah was there and Abdullah didn't talk to me or talk to anybody really. And he would come in and I would sit there in my chair and I would see him sit down. Hell, for like two weeks, I believe he was really from the Sudan. <laughs> I, thought, I finally told somebody, I says, does Abdullah speak English? And they went, well, yeah. I said, well, is he from the Sudan? They looked at me like, are you stupid? Which I would have replied, yes. They said, he's from Canada. Of course he speaks English. What the hell? I said, he's not. And he kind of broke my heart, really. I said, I thought he was from, I was believing his gimmick. I thought he was from the Sudan. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was very credible. And you know what? When I was about four or five years old, he used to, you know, he used to work for my dad. Hold, my hold on one second, James. I got to let this dog in. He's going nuts out here. We're going to have to break this. One second. So, so let me say, here's what I think of Abdullah. Um, when I was four or five years old, my, he used to work for my dad. Mm -hmm. And, he, you know, he used to scare the hell out of me in the dressing room with all those scars he had in his face and and those I big call, I called it roadmaps. It looked like a roadmap. Yeah, it was incredible. And, 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 and the guy had, you know, had those things between those legs that we have there. He had a lot of those because, you know, he used to go into the crowd. He used to rush in the crowd. He used to what, not be afraid of anybody. And that would, that would scare everybody. And, 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 and one day I end up like I was – I think it was 19 or 20 years old. I ended up, he was across me in the ring. I was wrestling him for the first time. And I couldn't believe it. He loved me so much because he loved my dad. He loved what my dad and my uncle did for him in the business. So he always mm -hmm. loved me, Abby. He used to make me go get hot dogs when I was seven, eight years old for him in the dressing room. And anyway, mm -hmm. so we had a great relationship all my life. And and when I ended up working with him, I remember him in Val d'Or, in Quebec, Val d'Or, Quebec. And he's against me in the ring. And he says to me, he says, uh, in the dressing room, he says, you're going to go ahead and suplex me. <laughs> and I said, what? Like, he's 400 pounds. And I go, like, he says, you're going to, don't worry, don't worry, champ. Don't worry. He says, I'll help. And uh, so I end up suplexing him in the, in the match. And I'll never forget that till the day I die. Because when I suplexed him, we fell. And he kind of got up halfway there. And I kind of twisted there real fast. And he took the bump. And, and he pooped in his pants. <laughs> and, 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 and he and he told me he says and he told me he says pin me pin me so i pinned him i thought he was going to kick out and and the referee counted he says he says, count me count me ref he says i i, I shit in my pants he says count me and, and so, so so i actually beat abdul i was 20 years old but uh, but but uh, but uh, but i loved the guy he was always very very uh, he was very grateful so what my father and my uncle did for him, he was always grateful. He, he's a good guy. I have a match with him in Puerto Rico. He beat me from go to woe. I got a little <laughs> bit of a, I got a little bit of a comeback on him, yeah. and I got my bull whip, yeah, and yeah. I whipped him a little bit. But in the tape that I got, yeah. that me bull whipping him, yeah, has been taken out. It's lost. Really, and <laughs> uh, and it was, I, I remember. I worked with him in Puerto Rico also after that. And that was a crazy place to work, wasn't it? Oh, Jeez. my God. Puerto Rico? Crazy. It was were you, uh, were you? No, you I wasn't were there. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're bro I didn't know, no, I didn't, did, I didn't know you worked Puerto Rico. Yeah, I worked Puerto Rico between characters in the WWF and Abdullah uh, for Carlos Colon. Yeah. And I went to work for Carlos Colon, and, and yeah, we did a couple of shows, and it was wild. It was like the people are nuts. They throw stuff at you. Like, you know, some places they throw beers in plastic uh, cups. You know, over there they throw the whole cans. It's like, you know, they, yeah. they, throw, and, they throw. And rocks. Yeah, exactly. And uh, broken glass. And anything and, they can put their hands on. And wasn't it amazing what happened with Brody? Like, oh, well, what amazing, That was in the time I was going. I mean, that was incredible, wasn't it? That was the time I was going. Like, you know, I just, and it was I, like was a, in the, I was in the dressing room. No way. No way. No way. Tell me about it. I can't believe it. Well, I had, I, I'll make this real short. This, uh, Tony Atlas people. was there, eh? Tony Atlas yeah. was there too? I'll make, this is your part. I mean, this, you're the guest, so I won't tell this real quick. Just because you asked, I was in the dressing room, and every time I was always in Puerto Rico, I always had this impending dread of like something was going to happen and i really really had it that day i was going and i rode to the match really? to, to the really? stadium with brody 
and another guy, he took us mm -hmm. and I walked in and it was like eating me up. Something was wrong. I mean, it was just the vibes on the way over there, the vibes in the dressing room. And I sat down way in the back of the corner. It's a baseball stadium. And uh, but the dress was there something was it something that you saw it was coming? Was there heat between the two guys, or was it like uh Yeah, there was heat between them, but I didn't know they had that much heat between them. But I just felt something wasn't right. And I sat down and I'm like this, I can't stay still. And I'm never like that. I said, I, I got to get out of here. So I, really? I got up and left, walked down the, you know, you got yeah, yeah, to the place, a, a little the tunnel place. to the, the, to the dugout. Yeah. That's yeah. when you go to the field. Yeah. So I, I sat out there about, I don't know, about not long, five minutes, seven minutes at the most. And I said, well, but the, the, the vibes were still bad. So I got up and walked down that tunnel and I heard shouting. No way. Before I got there and I got from up. From the fans or from the dressing no, room? No, from the dressing room. It was, I was screaming and, you know, and, hey, hey, and people were running here. And I, and I asked somebody, I said, hey, uh, what happened? And they said, uh, I forgot what somebody said, said, Jose did something oh. to Brody. Now, everybody in Puerto Rico was named Jose. Coach, yeah, we had a couple yeah. of guys yeah, in the dressing yeah. room named yeah. Jose. Yeah, and Vader yeah. was one of them. I said, what? And they said it again. And he, I said, what? They said, invader, invader. He stabbed Brody. And I went, what the? That's one thing you don't expect. And I walk in. And the first thing I see laying on the floor. No way. Bro Brody, he stretched out blood no coming way. out of his no chest. Way. A doctor over him. No and way. The dressing room was in like pandemonium. I no mean, way. No way. Because they had went, they had gone no. into a shower, and while I was out, they had gone into the shower and they had words. And Invader had taken a knife in there with them. No way. No. And way. that's 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 where it started. But nobody saw the fight. They only saw when they came out of that. Out of my, shower area. my philosophy of this, my story of this, and from, from only hearsay and from, from hearsay, from second and third hearsays, you know, from second, third people. Yeah. Brody was sometimes he was stiff in the in the room in the ring with guys. Yeah. Brody was stiff. So so the story that I heard is like he was stiff with him and he was And, and that's how we got back. That's all I know. But but I couldn't believe that it would go to that extent. And then what I can't believe is that he got away with it. You know, the, the guy who did well, it. There, bro. This was the charge. Invader claimed self-defense. And he never denied doing it. He, oh, yeah. He said Brody mm -hmm. attacked him. Really? Uh, that's what he said. And so... But this is this is what you got. You got a Puerto Rican jury. Exactly. And Invader was like a national hero. Exactly. And Brody, Brody was portrayed on TV as a crazy man. Yeah. So yeah exactly. People, people got to thinking, well, what exactly. if that crazy man went oh. crazy on me? What would I do? I would do anything I could to get him off me and keep him from killing me. It made sense me. to them. It made and, sense to the people. And, and they acquitted him. And when they adjourned to go to the deliberations, the jury was out maybe an hour, I heard. And they had lunch when they went out, and then they came back and they gave the bill. They didn't say he was innocent. They said he was just not guilty of the charges. So... And it's been that way ever since. It's the first time I hear the story. I'm so happy you told me, Dutch, because I, I you know, I, I, I couldn't conceive something like that happening in the dressing room, you know. And and I'm saying, like, you know, we uh, there's a lot of crazy boys out there. You know, there were in our days. And, day. and Tony, Tony Atlas, Tony Atlas went with them to the hospital because the little paramedics they only weigh like 150 160 pounds everybody was, must have been they was trying to been afraid of of him after eh? uh, of, of, of invader invader yeah well he's he's kind of nuts anyway is he i don't know him i don't remember i may he's have met him in the dressing when i was there i don't even remember him 
but Brody was so big, the paramedics couldn't get him up the three or four or five steps that we had to go. And uh, Tony so Adams picked it. So he was still alive. Put him in there. He was still he was, alive when you got in the dressing room. Oh yeah, he he was he was alive after the hospital, and oh, he yeah. didn't pass he didn't pass oh, away yeah. to five o'clock in the morning. This is what happened: they couldn't stop the bleeding. I don't know if that's ever they've ever let that out, you know, because Brody took a lot of aspirin, and so his, aspirin so his blood aspirin, was clear. His blood was and, clear, and it was thin. Yeah, that's why they could not stop the bleeding. They actually operated on him twice. Really? After the matches were over that night, I actually got in the car and I said, take me to the hospital to where he is. And it was Centro Medico or like Central Hospital or something. Mm -hmm. And I and I pulled up and I saw a guy out in, you know, the, the, the blues. I said, hey, is Bruiser Brody the wrestler here? He said, yeah, I'm the, who are you? And I told him, he said, oh, yeah, everybody knew you. Mm -hmm. I said, how's was, how was Brody? And he says, well, he said, I'm the surgeon who operated on him. And he was outside. Oh smoking a cigarette, walking and on the phone, telling somebody, I guess. And he says, well, it's touch and go right now. So we don't know. Touch and go. I didn't like the sound of that. How did so you went, feel? How did you feel the next day when you got the news? Like, how did, did you work the next night or was it just a one? No, shot? no, we, we all bought, boycotted the show. I wanted to leave. I just couldn't get off the island because the ticket was for Monday and they wouldn't change. I couldn't change the ticket for a Sunday. So nobody, nobody went to the show that day. We all boycotted the show. They had to cancel the show. They had like five, 6,000 people at the show. We just didn't go, so we had to cancel it. So it was, and then word come around, oh, they're going to kill everybody. And I went, why did they kill us? I, <laughs> but, but it was, <laughs> Holy shit, I but, got you know how, but you know how your mind works, crazy things on you? I'm up, and I'd been up all day, and now Brody is... <laughs> And You're I'm on thinking, the list. You're said, on the they, list, Dutch. I'm kidding. I said, they could be coming to get me. <laughs> and and I'm sitting in my room, and I wasn't, I was like third floor up, and I said, they could come in the lobby, open the door, Man. and the guy would be thinking at the desk, he'd think they're just a guest, and they could come up and be on the first floor Man. and the second floor. Then they could, <laughs> and my door was right at the top of the stairs, mm -hmm. and I says, they could come right up to my door and then I opened my door and I looked out and I had a little balcony and I was trying to, I was Dutch, trying to map out I gotta my tell you something. I, I got to tell you something Dutch. I swear you're bringing me back memory lane. When I, <laughs> when I, when I punched dynamite kid, when I did what I did and, and, and I went to right then to see Vince right away. And, 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 and when I got in the room, Vince locked us in a room and, and, and the, and the, and the, there was so much heat on me, so much heat that I was behind this closed door and I took a chair and I put the chair. Uh -uh. The, I swear, because your brain plays yeah, when you're, yeah. when you're, in a, when you're in a state of mind like that, your, your, your mind plays games on you. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I swear I was looking out the same thing as you. I was looking at something that I could pick up to defend myself because I knew there was a lot of guys that 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 that, that, that were going to, to to be pissed off at this, you know, and, and 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 so because they were all afraid of the bulldog, so they didn't. They were all getting on his side, but 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 paranoia does a lot of things to your oh, brain. It does. It, and it was late at night, and I remember Brody's wife called me later on, and I'd never no talked way, I'd no never way. talked to her in my life. <laughs> and when I I went to my room that night, I told the desk clerk, I said, if if, if a call comes in for Brody. Send it to my room. So it came in. They said, you have a call from Barbara Goodish. And I knew his name was Frank Goodish. And I said, okay. And I talked to her. And I've said this a thousand times. You don't have to remember anything when you tell the truth all the time. Exactly. She said, what happened? And she had gotten a call. And I says, well, I didn't want her unduly alarm her any more than I. Than so he wasn't be. dead yet? No. That was like four o'clock. He died about five o'clock. And I told her she needed to get to Puerto Rico as soon as she could because Frank could probably use her. And so when she went uh, to the airport, I guess right after that, and got a ticket for her and her son. And they came down there. And how she found out that he had, he had died was she ran into uh, Abdullah at the airport. 
And Abdullah says, he just looked at her and said, he's gone, he's gone. And she says, what? He's gone, he's gone. I mean, I thought he would have let her kind of been a little more soft in that delivery of the of the news. But then they had somebody to pick her up. I think Carlos's wife went to get her, I think. And but by the time she got there, he had he had already he had already passed away. Crazy. Anyway, and thanks for thanks for shoot, the info. I, I never heard the story and well shoot forward to about nine months, ten months. And they told me that well, if we want you to appear, we'll send you a, uh, a summons. Oh, yeah, to go to court? To go to court. But I guess they sent me one. But guess when I got it? I already knew the verdict by the time I opened the summons. Okay. So they, you didn't go. Well, there was nothing I could say anyway. And you know what? I'll tell you, I'll tell you something between related to the stories when that happened. That was the last time a month before that, or that I took a booking in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. I never, a lot took, of, a, I never a lot took a booking after that. It was like a hey, lot man. of guys. A lot enough, of guys that the fans, that. enough that the fans were crazy, like mad crazy. That's the craziest I've ever seen. Now it's the, the office, you know, like it's like forget it. <laughs> you know, I, if you know, yeah. if you give a, imagine if you give a, a potato, you know, imagine if you give, you're working with him and you hurt him by accident. You know, you, yeah, yeah, you know, you'd say, what is it? You know, like uh, I've never you know, fought, fought more fans than I did in Puerto Rico. It was a saying, fight every night. Exactly. Every yeah. night. Exactly. And Raymond and I, we did that. I did that with him. I did that on my own. And uh, and uh, and it was like I was I was afraid when I worked there. Uh, I'm not afraid to say that I was afraid to make it to the stand, the baseball stand, all the way, like you said, the the field, all the way up to the ring. I was always afraid. So have we covered everything that year. Well, I, I got some more questions I want to ask you. You work continental with Robert Fuller and Ron Fuller, right? Yep. Yep. You enjoy that? I loved it. I I, I worked uh, I worked for Ron Fuller a little bit. It was mostly with Robert. Yeah. But Robert Robert Fuller for me, the greatest yeah, man. Yeah, greatest. Greatest man for me, the greatest. You know what? I'm going to give you a scoop. If by the time this comes out, I don't know when this is coming out, but tonight I'm going to Hulk Hogan's uh, hangout and uh, with Robert. I'm going with Robert. We're going to see Hulk Hogan tonight. I haven't seen him in years. In Tampa? You know yeah, in Tampa. I'm in Orlando oh. now. You know, I'm the only guy, only Canadian I ever beat Hulk Hogan. You know that, eh, Dutch? I'm the only Canadian. He you told me, you, you yeah, told yeah. me that. So, 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 so I'm going to see him now. I'll go pin him again in his own place. <laughs> Get some pictures of that. I will. But Robert Fuller, let me tell you something about Robert Fuller. He took me in. You know, I wrestled for for Continental in Knoxville, yeah, and then that territory, and then they moved to Pensacola. And when Robert got to Pensacola, he he loved the way I worked. He loved the he loved me, and he just took me under his wing. And uh, I was the first uh, uh, champion, uh, the heavyweight champion in my career, beating Joe Leduc. You know, he put me over with Joe Leduc. They shaved my head. They do an angle where he he put E3, and I was a nice blonde looking kid there, and he he shaved my head. We did a great angle. But he, did he have did he have some stories or what? Man, but not only that, he he, he I, I used to ride with him all the time. So so, <laughs> when, so, so yeah, I know. I, I used to ride, but I used to do bookings with him, like assistant booking, doing the TVs for yeah. Dolphin, doing the. So I learned so much with him, you know. And and uh -huh. during the day, and during the day, I go play ping pong and pool at his house. You know, we were really buddies. So so it was like it, it was it was a Robert Fuller for me. You know the the nicest man and the most brilliant with storylines. You know, like oh, uh, he, was, he he had so many. He draw a lot of money. You know, in Pensacola with uh, and with his brother. You know, and Bob Armstrong in those days. And you know, there, there was a uh, Rob. They should. That's another family that should be in the Hall of Fame. Is the Welches? That's yep. incredible that they're, they're not in the Hall of Fame. Is it Buddy Welch? What was his father? Uh, Ron and and, and Robert. Uh, Buddy father. Buddy Fuller, but his name was Buddy Welch. Yeah, Buddy Fuller, he was a wrestler too, right? Yeah, he was. Oh, a, yeah. And oh, a yeah. Smart guy. Oh, yeah. He used to give me finishes where I was be going, I was going to get beat. And he'd give it to me in such a way, he said, and you get that son of a bitch and you beat him. And I'm going, yeah, yeah. And then you do this. And then all of a sudden, you, he makes a big comeback and you're selling. I'm going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he does something <laughs> and then one, two, three, and he pins you. I was so excited to go get beat. <laughs> 
I couldn't wait to get out there. He made it sound yeah. so oh, good. Yeah. So that's where Robert got it from then. Oh, yeah. It's, it's an, and, and, and Ron, too. And they got some great stories. I need to have Ron or Robert Fuller on this podcast. I'll send you his phone number. I'll, I'll get you know. No, I got his number. number. I hadn't talked to him in a while. You need to. You, you're gonna. You, this is gonna be amazing. You and him together on a podcast will be amazing. Oh my God! So anyway, hey, listen. Uh, one more thing. Any stories about Eric Bischoff? You get along with him? Uh, well, okay, folks, right here is. is I like when people say, well, I'm not going to say anything bad about him. Well, here's the story. But, about here's the story about Eric Bischoff. I don't know the guy. Yeah. I just, I just, I just know that he, uh, he, he, he talked to me like it was an asshole one time and that was it. But, 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 you know, so, so he's working with WCW and I'm going to WCW uh, for, from WWF. So he's the booker. And when I got there for a reason or another, we, me and Carl Willett were tag team. We just came out the Quebecers from the WWF and, and he doesn't like us for, for, for he doesn't believe in us or whatever. He has his own clique and his own people. And then the, the, so, so in the same time that we're there doing the TVs once in a while, we're not getting pushed. We're doing jobs. We're not being in a good position. And uh, it must have shown on my face that I wasn't very happy, you know, and stuff. And I, and uh, so that's when I worked my deal with Hulk to come work in Montreal you know, when he was NWO, the, the, the hottest thing in the <laughs> NWO. So Hulk liked me a lot. So, so, so we, um, so I had him come to Montreal and then I opened the doors to WCW uh, for the first show and the only show they ever had in Canada is in Montreal. And I'm the one who booked it for them and promoted it for them. But at the condition, I had the lawyers in there, the TV station in there, but the, the condition was that I work against Hulk in main event. And, uh, oh, now and that so, story makes sense. Now I got yeah. it. So, so when I got there, but the weirdest thing is, is when I got into Montreal, when we got in the dressing room, Hulk comes up in front of all the boys and he says, Flair was there, uh, you know, uh, Malenko, uh, Guerrero, you know, all the guys that were there. And, 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 and he says in front of everybody, he says, uh, okay, boss, he calls me boss. <laughs> he says, okay, boss, says, what are we doing tonight? Uh -huh. And I looked at him and I started laughing because it's very funny, you know, like he's the biggest icon that ever existed in my mind anyway. And, you know, and uh, if wrestling is what it is today and tomorrow and yesterday is because of Hulk Hogan for me as part of it uh -huh. in there. And then so I have that respect for him. So when he uh, tells me, he says, what are we doing you know, for the finish? I laughed. I laughed. And all the boys laughed too in the dressing room. And next thing you know, he's looking at me, he says, I'm serious. That's what, he says, how am I putting you over tonight? Uh-huh. So I looked at him and then I laughed even harder. Like I really almost lost it, you know, laughing because he's telling me in front of everybody, I'm going to go over, you know. Don't you and, wish you that we had phone cameras then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then anyway, but he'll vouch, he'll vouch for it. But anyway, I'll just to say that, uh, that uh, when I beat him, no chairs, no gimmick, just a small package, one, two, three, right in the middle of the ring. When that got back to Bischoff the next day. Uh-oh. Man. Yeah. And I think, and I still up to this day, I, I have no proof of what I'm saying. This is speculation on my part. I think that never let, I was, facts, never let facts get in the way of a good story. Continue think, the story. But I think that I wasn't the only one that had heat with Bishop. <laughs> like, I think that Bishop and Hulk, they were trying to see who was boss yep. there. Like, you know, who was trying to boss. Uh, he was boss booking, but Hulk was Hulk, you know, and I think there was a little conflict there. So Hulk, I think by putting me over, he gave a little receipt to Bishop. I'm not too sure about that. I also have a, I have a story that I think that also Hulk put me over because of the thing I did to the Bulldog. Because mm -hmm. I think he was he, I think he was tired of all the bullshit that they were doing and uh, that I stood up <laughs> to him. That I stood yeah. up to the Bulldog. I think that, that, that Hulk, I, this is all speculation, but I think that Hulk had a lot of respect for me that I stood up for them. So, so, and he had a lot of respect for the Rougeau family. You know, I, I remember him saying in one time, you know, uh, why'd you do it, Hulk? And he says, well, Johnny Rougeau, Jacques Rougeau, Raymond Rougeau, Arma Rougeau, 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 Rougeau. He says, uh -huh. it's for me, it's a way of saying thank you. And then, so there's all these stories possible, the reasons why that it could have happened. But I know that you know, when we got back to WCW, the next TV taping, I remember Bischoff coming up to me and he put me against the giant, you know, Paul White, you know, and the, yeah. uh, and, the, and another, he had the giant there and, and with Carl Willette, we're in a tag team. It was the giant with somebody. And he told the giant, he says, you're going to take Jacques and you're going to throw him over the top into the table and then the floor, you know? And, and I looked at him and I said, no, I said, no, you're not. 
I said, uh, I, I'm the veteran here, Carl Willett, PCO, the young guy that I brought in, WWF, you know, uh, Quebecer. He takes those bumps and he likes to take those bumps. I said, not mm -hmm. me. You know, I'm not doing that. I can't. I'm not able. I'm not. He says, yep, you're going to do it. He says, you're going to take the choke slam. So we had a little altercation there. And finally, I took the choke slam in the middle. But Paul White was so nice to me, it looked bad, the choke slam. But yeah. anyway, he, he, could, he almost put a pillow underneath me when he put me down. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I think so. So that's where we stand, me and Bischoff. And the funniest thing is I was at a Comic-Con. I think you were there, too, not long ago. Bischoff was there. And again, and, and someone, and I was taking a picture with someone, I can't remember who it was, and Bischoff just popped right beside me. And I turned, and I swear to God, it was spontaneous. I said, hey, Eric, I said, let's take a picture. So I took a picture with, with him and somebody else. I can't remember who it was. And then and I put it on my Facebook, like, oh, let bygones be bygones. What the hell? Oh, yeah. That's what it is. Hey, you know, listen, you know how long we've talked? 45 minutes. How much? 45 about an hour and a half. No way. I well, an hour and it says hour 34. But I'm I sorry. A little break. Didn't no, no. It, we need to do another one. I mean, we didn't get a half the stuff out. No, no. I think I said what I had to say. <laughs> I can't stand no, you. No you, you got a ton okay. more. So. <laughs> but anyway, I had hey, enough of Dutch Mandel for a couple of years. <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> hey, James, you got anything to say? Thank you. Is James here? He yeah, sorry, it takes me like 10 seconds to like load myself up. Here. Uh, no, I'm happy for you to do the outro. All right. So, Jock, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. You've been a, a fabulous guest <laughs> because <laughs> you're a good talker. You're entertaining. <laughs> you're positive. You're up. I think people will enjoy this one. And since James has no uh, questions for you, I'd like to bring you back. Well, that's, that's very we'll do, that's we'll memorable jock, for you to say that. That's, that's we'll, that. we'll do jock number two. Listen, and, Dutch, I, I, you'll always be number one. And then, and, and I gotta tell you, Dutch, <laughs> I like that cigar, that look there. You look, oh, yeah, there, and then the, the mustache there. Yeah, like, they should, I, they, they, but, should uh, they should do a, a chain of restaurants should, in the states there. They, with that they should, they should. I, I think so. so you're, 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 you know, you've I'm, always been to, for me to finish off, Dutch. I just want to say this. I want to thank all the fans for all my career that were there to hate me and to love me and to support me in my characters and all that and to, to always be nice to me outside the ring. And I want to thank, I want to apologize to all the wrestlers that I seem cocky and that I've seen sometimes that I, I'm just different. And I know it today. I understand. You are now. different. I am. And, but You're I, a I different bird. I, I wish I could go back. But anyway, all this <laughs> to say, I want to thank you, Dutch, because since the moment you met me, I was a young kid because you're a lot older than me. And I was a young kid and you always <laughs> took me in. You always took me in and you always were nice to me. You always gave me good advice and helped me. And I'll never forget that, Dutch. I never will. Well, I liked you because you were very respectful. And I mean, I, I never I never tried to downgrade anybody. I really liked you because you're a good talker, even even when you started out. I mean, your story is what you would tell. It, it wouldn't even be about wrestling, but it would be entertaining, and it made those miles go by fast. So anyway, listen, uh, don't forget, fans, that Jacques starts, your competition starts May May 7th. 7th. If you want to go see the on, on the website, follow it. It's wrestling-academy.ca. And you could go also on my Facebook. If you go, it's public, my Facebook. You have everything on there. Jacques Rougeau, you'll see me and my girlfriend. We're, we're the picture, the profile picture. But follow this competition. It's the biggest competition that Canada and in the world, actually, right now, where three winners are going to win $10,000, spend three months at the Nightmare Factory with Cody Rhodes, Billy Gunn, and QT Marshall. And it's just going to be except, it's going to be fun for me. And this is fun for me to take the torch and, and pass it to the younger generation of wrestlers, a passion that's been with me all my life. Okay. Glad to hear it. Okay. I want every real American or every real Canadian to please rise, put your hand over, over your heart, and say along with me, we, the people. See you next week. <laughs>